in the midst of uh, COVID and uh, the pandemic of racism and the natural disasters that are going on around us, it, it you know taking care of ourselves sometimes means putting your head a little bit under the covers. But when you come out, uh, have you thought about what does the church need to do differently to be vital, effective, relevant in the world that is taking shape around us right now? I would say for me uh, is listen. Listen to what the world is telling us, um, and and how and use this time. Um, I think that you know. I will just say that during this COVID time, um, especially, life's gotten a little simpler, right? Um, you know, in the beginning of COVID. People went back to riding bicycles. Uh, we went on our morning walks here. Life got simpler. Uh, got to meet my neighbors, uh, see who they were, people I had never met. Um, you know, met the dogs in the neighborhood, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I think maybe it's been kind of good for us. Um, so in this time, you know, did you try to buy yeast? Early on, you couldn't buy yeast. Uh, you couldn't buy a bike. Um, so I think maybe making life much more simple um, and understanding that if we listen to one another um, and listen to the stuff around us, um, you know, I, I live in Southwest Louisiana or South Louisiana. Southwest Louisiana got battered by two hurricanes, one after another, then we had a third. You had a pandemic, racial unrest, and then three hurricanes. You know, it, it, it all gets kind of crazy really fast. But what I learned is as I listened to these people, uh, particularly in the Lake Charles area, um, they were resilient. You know, um, they were faithful. Uh, they brought me to tears um, more, than, uh, more than once. Um, and so I, I, I think about, um, could we could we use this time as a Sabbath? Uh, could we listen carefully, like even listen to nature? Um, you know, I, it's like I noticed things I never noticed before. It's like I'm sure that magnolia tree blooms every year, um, but I just noticed it this year. Uh, so if we're going to be vital again. Um, how do we listen? How do we learn from one another right now? How do we leverage what we're learning in this experience um, to, to move forward in a different way? And, you know, every, all the rules kind of, it's like, you know, worship, no worship, online, in person, mass, no mass, all of those things. I, I just think we, um, if we just get down to the basics of, blocking and tackling, as they say, of what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus. Um, can I listen um, deeply uh, to the people around me, to the nat to nature? Um, so if there's one thing I would say is listen, and, and I'll say that I'm having, I have to work on this myself. It's not something that comes you know, easily to many of us, right? Is to listen deeply. Uh, but if we're going to be vital again, um, we really got to listen to one another. And maybe in this time that we've had for the last nine months, what have we learned? What have we learned about just sort of the basics of how we uh, relate and come together? Who would you listen to who you think has not been heard in our denomination? Because you, you talked a little bit about margins, leading from the center of the margins, hearing the voices on the margins. Um, who do you think you would listen to in particular? And, and I know it would be everyone in, in reality, but are there voices that have not been heard that uh, need particular attention in terms of listening? Yeah, um, yes. I mean, I, I really do think, uh, I think often, um, as I follow my friends down in, for example, in South Texas, um, you know, we, the, the COVID is just rampant in some of those areas. 
uh, El Paso is, you know, off the charts. Um, we haven't, you know, the Native American uh, community is suffering greatly. We haven't really heard, heard and, and, and I'll take some responsibility for that. Um, I think that there are people we have just not tuned our ear to. We might have heard them, but I'm not sure we have listened and really tune our ear. And it's always the people on the margins. And, and one of the things I've learned living in South Louisiana in a disaster zone is that in a disaster, and I would call this time being sort of in a disaster, is that the marginalized just get more marginalized, right? So people of color, um, it's like, their life is on the edge. Uh, and some of these folks were living on the edge long before a pandemic, and now here we are. I'm so thankful for doctors and nurses and physical therapists and all of those people who have been incredibly um, tax and essential. Um, but I also think about the person in the food service uh, or the laundry. And, um, you know, I just, I, 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 I think we need to listen uh, for that. And I think we've gotten a little bit of a glimpse of that when, uh, but it, it's on television, <laughs> you know, it's on social media. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about whether my child got fed lunch, um, but I know that there are people who do. I know there are people who do. Well, you mentioned stress, and certainly mm -hmm. here in the United States, there's societal stress. And um, over the last several months, you know, we've had the very high uh, profile uh, killings of African American people, uh, George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor. Can you say uh, something about that in terms of mm -hmm. how does the church uh, begin to address racism? Where are we with that? Where are we going? Um, you know, first of all, I think we've got to repent for our sins of the past. Um, you know, the church is not immune uh, to our our racism that, that's been baked into who we are. Um, so I, I, I just have to be upfront and say that right up front. Um, and I think that for some people, it you can take giant steps and for some of us, it can just be baby steps. And, um, and, and both equally important depending on the context. Uh, again, I live in the South and I live in Louisiana where racism is you know, alive and well. And um, I, uh, we've done these wonderful, uh, we did these modules, we did about four modules of, you know, anti-racism, you know, white fragility, uh, and, and it was, we had you know, several hundred or about a hundred or so people, it wasn't a mandatory thing, participate, and I thought, you know, for the first time, some of us use the words white fragility and white privilege uh, and, and race and called it for what it was. Uh, so it, we, we took baby steps. Are we there? No. Um, will we get there? You know, I pray. Uh, but I think that we, the church, if not the church, then, you know, who else? <laughs> uh, I can't leave it to somebody else. And so um, we've, I think we're, we're starting to address this in ways with the dismantling racism campaign. You know, when you dismantle something, something you've got to do it one piece at a time. Um, if you tear down the whole thing, <clears throat> it, it, you know, that, that could be tragic. So I think dismantling this one piece at a time might just be what, what we can commit to doing right now, but we've got to commit to moving forward and being a voice. Um, you know, as United Methodists, um, like I said, we, we have a, a sordid past uh, when it comes to racist issues, but uh, I think it's time for us to, to really move forward and take a step that perhaps others aren't courageous enough to take. And, and we've got to be courageous. Uh, that's what it's going to take. Um, so for us to be able to say Black lives do matter, uh, that's courageous for, for some people that have never used those words before. And so I, I'm going to celebrate every small victory and those large victories we will celebrate as well. But for some people, it's got to be baby steps. For some people, it's giant leaps. And it's, it, we've got to all 
start moving some direction or we're going to be here again. And what I don't want to do is wait till the next George Floyd for all of us to rally up again. Um, you know, we, our memories are, are short. Uh, we always have racial amnesia sometimes. And so I, I want to make sure that this stays in front of people and that we continue to speak, uh, speak truth into this and claim it and as our um, as our responsibility as as United Methodists, but also as just faithful followers of Jesus. This is this is what we have as our priority right now.